Hello, it's uh, Paul Beck with again. So I'm continuing on uh, this very difficult topic um, about these enormous risks and consequences that our society faces from abrupt climate change, including global food shortages, including uh, fresh water shortages, power grids collapsing across entire countries, um, and uh, even the U.S. military uh, being unable to function within about two decades due to abrupt climate change. You know, all of the different cascading feedbacks and tipping points and things being crossed, you know, as we head to a much more, uh, you know, unstable and uh, risk, risky uh, world in, in our, in, with the climate crisis. You know, and meanwhile, people still are fiddling, basically, not addressing the problem. So where I left off before in the previous video was talking about the possibility of sea level rising two meters by 2100, you know, according to this article from uh, May 20th, 2019. So I went to the source, which is open source. Okay, so this is the article, Ice Sheet Contributions to Future Sea Level Rise from Structured Expert Judgment. So 22 experts, were, you know, and they looked basically, what do they say? Okay, they say that despite considerable pro progress, advances in process understanding, numerical modeling, and the observational record of ice sheet contributions to global mean, mean sea level rise, since the fifth assessment report that came out in 2013, severe limitations remain in the predictive capability of ice sheet models. So new studies come along and things are melting faster than expected. So the contribution of the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica are the largest source of uncertainty to project future sea level rise. So basically uh, coming, you know, uh, since AR5, Assessment Report 5, the IPCC report in 2013, expert uncertainty has grown because of ice dynamics. Okay, for example, you know, uh, dynamic calving at the calving front due to the, uh, you know, the, the, due to weakening of the structure of the ice, undercutting of the ice from below, from meltwater, and all these other different things on both Greenland and Antarctic. And with unchecked emissions growth, which is the pathway we're on, we're getting more like 51 to 178 centimeters, something in that range. So approaching two meters of sea level rise, when you add thermal expansion and glacier contributions, and you exceed two meters of sea level rise at the 95th percentile. Okay, um, so, you know, the report goes into the details, and I'm not going to talk about all the details. I'm just going to say that there's, you know, probability density models for, you know, um, for a slow case, you know, and a high, a slow temperature, a low temperature rise, and a high temperature rise, and there's a range of sea level rises. And if you get up here, you know, 178 centimeters, you know, two meters of sea level rise. And you talk about the long tail of distributions and so on. You know, and there's all these different studies and stuff. You know, different uh, studies with errors from, you know, experts. And you know, my guess or best judgment is that there'll be a paper like this in a few more years and all these numbers will be greatly revised up and this will continue happening you know until we have multi multimeters of sea level rise and people just don't want to believe that it can happen and lo and behold there we'll we'll get it so anyway i hope i'm wrong but we'll see um one of the things that is getting a lot of coverage in that report is the fragility of the power grid. So talk a little bit about California. You can look at this article, Climate Change is Contributing to California Fires. No kidding. Dry seasons are intensifying, increasing fire risk. When the Santa Ana winds, the autumn winds kick in, like this week, flames break loose and they throttle down the power grid. Okay, so these are some of the big fires. This article was revised and the latest version just came out a couple of days ago. California is burning again. 
And it talks about the, since the 80s, the size and ferocity of the fires has trended upwards. 15 of the largest 20 fires have occurred since 2000. Since the 1970s, the air, air, amount of area burned in the state has increased by a factor of five. You know, California's warm, warmed about three degrees Fahrenheit in the last century. The global average, uh, more than the global average of about one degree Fahrenheit. Okay, this should be uh, Celsius, I think. I think they've got the units wrong there. Hotter air draws water out of the plants and soils more efficiently than cool, leaves the trees, shrubs, and rolling grasslands dry, primed to burn. You know, diseases affect them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the effect increases exponentially with every degree of warming. Today's hotter climate change air is much more effective at drying vegetation to a crackle than it was 100 years ago. And, uh, you know, it goes on and on about the problem with the wind and the gusts can reach 70 or 80 miles an hour. These Santa Ana winds, they come down the big mountain ranges of the Sierras. They uh, get, undergo adiabatic heating. They're, they're, they're as dry as a bone. The air gets channeled into canyons and valleys, speeding as it falls. You know, gravity, gravity fed. Gusts can reach 70 to 80 miles an hour. If they pass over a flame, they spread it far and wide. That's exactly what happened during 2018's Campfire, 2017's Thomas Fire, and many, many more. You know, remember how quickly Paradise got incinerated. People were found in their cars trying to leave. Okay, so this is getting a worse and worse problem. And California has to wake up and fix the grid. I mean, they've known for years there were going to be grid problems. They privatized their power grid. Um, they knew there would be brownouts and blackouts and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, the 2018 fires destroyed the town of Paradise, killed more than 100, caused some $30 billion in damage, sent PG&E, the power company, into Chapter 11 reorganization. Okay, so the company wants to avoid this, so they shut the power off. They de-energize the power lines. Um, you know, lights go off, refrigerators go off, you know, 600,000 customers, 800,000 customers, a million. You know, it might be the right move for their balance sheet, but it has tr huge costs. You know, this voluntary outage could, could not voluntary, it's not voluntary to the people, voluntary to the company. Um, could be more than, the loss could be more than $2 billion a day, cost borne by their customers, not the utility. Okay, um, so Californians don't have to put up with this. There's going to be a huge interest in backup power, solar plus batteries, natural gas generators, everything else. You know, it turns out you cannot rely on the power grid. Of course, Senator Bernie Sanders is right in there. You know what's going on. Irresponsible corporate greed threatened the health and safety of 800,000 Californians. Meanwhile, PG&E PG &E has paid out billions to its shareholders. My Green New Deal will build a 21st century energy grid that will deliver clean, reliable power to all. So can they bury the line? Can they use concrete and steel poles you know, with, that are much higher up? You know, there's lots of different ways to repair it and they need to do that. Now, I talked in previous videos about the, one of the things is um, 30 to 40% of the cost of maintaining the U.S. military, say in, in hot, arid environments, is the cost of water. They get bottled water, they get water from wells, and it causes huge costs and lots of soldiers undergo dehydration. So there's different technologies that are being worked on. So crystalline nets harvest water from the desert air, turn carbon dioxide into liquid fuel. So here, here's, here's a solar panel. Um, there's there's uh, devices that are powered that go in and, and uh, they extract water from the air and fill up water bottles essentially. So extracting water from the air. So um, there's an engineer who grew up in Jordan, a man outside of a man, and this, his neighborhood had received water for only five hours once every two weeks. Okay, um, so he's a chemist, so he's been working on this porous crystalline material known as a metal organic framework, MOF, that acts like a sponge. It sucks water vapor out of the air, even in the desert, and releases it as liquid water. 
Okay, um, so the, it's, it's like a Tinker Toy set or Meccano set. Do you remember those toys? So the, the links, the, the uh, apex, the, the, the metal atoms are hubs in the Tinker Toy set, and there's organic links connecting the hubs, and these things create uh, spaces and they can capture uh, molecules. By matching, mixing and matching the metals and linkers, they can tailor the pore size to capture gas molecules such as water vapor or even CO2 to get CO2 out of the air. Okay, so they're using, they're, they're looking, studying this, they're looking at different metals and different organic molecules and, you know, they're starting to have success. Okay, the industry is expected to go from, uh, to 410 million per year from 70 million per year this year over that's within five years huge growth rate so this is the idea these are the metals here these are the organic uh, polymers um, connecting them it creates a, a space here that can capture molecules like water molecules and then that water molecule you capture a bunch together they coalesce and then drip off the structure to fill a bottle so they use zirconium first as a metal um, but it was costing 160 per kilogram Okay, then they came up with aluminum, which costs three dollars per kilogram. So they put this this MOF in a small plastic container, kept it open in the air at night, so it absorbed water vapor, closed the container during and exposed it to sunlight. The liquid water was driven from it, but they were getting 0.2 liters per kilogram of MOF per day. And then they've uh, improved it. They can do dozens of cycles daily use a solar panel and a heater, and then they get now 1.3 liters of per water per kilogram of MOF per day from desert air. And they think they can improve that to eight to 10. Um, and they started a company called Water Harvesting that plans to release a microwave-sized device that can do eight liters per day. A scaled up version could do 22,500 liters per day and supply a small village or an army. Okay, so they're making water mobile. Wherever, wherever, the, wherever you are, they could use this and start capturing material. Um, and there's other applications of this material, but follow this. It's a very interesting technology. Now let's get back to the, the actual U.S. military. And they churn out more greenhouse gas emissions than entire countries. The Pentagon is the world's biggest consumer of fossil fuels and agent of climate change. So this is a September 13th, 2019, a recent article. Um, so basically Biden at one of the presidential debates with CNN, he said the first thing that happened when Obama and I were elected, we went over to what they call the tank in the Pentagon, sat down and got a briefing on the greatest danger facing our security. And you know what they told us? The military told them climate change, climate change. Climate change is the single greatest concern for war and disruption in the world, short of a nuclear exchange. And I talked about the effect of a nuclear exchange, even just a, a, a relatively small one between India and Pakistan and how that would cause a nuclear winter threatening global food supplies. Okay, so, and it goes on and talks about, you know, the last five years have been the hottest in human history. Department of Defense found that two thirds of the military's operationally critical facilities are threatened by climate change, including flooding, droughts and wildfire, but they're not a passive victim in the coming climate catastrophe. The climate change threatens the U.S. military as much as it threatens everything else. The U.S. military, however, is one of the largest, single biggest climate change contributors in the world. The U.S. military produced 1.2 billion metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions, or as much as 257 million passenger cars each year, so annually. Roughly as many registered vehicles as there are in the entire U.S. It's a higher output than entire countries. The total emissions from war-related activity in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, and Syria is, a, is 400 million metric tons of carbon dioxide alone. So the, this is huge, and there's a report on the costs of war, which breaks all this down. 
and talks about it and it's just uh it's horrifying how much how many fossil fuels are used by the military thanks again for listening